move to that. But in fact, what I'll, what I'll start out by doing is just uh, giving you a little bit of background about uh, where I came from and, uh, and, and my experience with Hatton. So I started my PhD with Hatton in, in 1988 uh, here at the lab at the Alfred. Uh, Chris Mitchell had just gone overseas. Steve Jane was well established on his, on his PhD. Um, George Bush, senior, had just been elected uh, and uh, the world was going in a very strange direction. Um, but that's, that's where we all started. And that was 25 years ago, which is amazing that it's all uh, come this far. So uh, when I actually got to the lab, uh, the first thing that I found out uh, was that Hatton had an unusual approach to many things in life. And the, the first thing he said to me was that research is like a ball of string. He said, all you have to do is pull a thread and it might not work the first time, but sooner or later you'll find something. Just pull the thread and research will happen. So I did this. <laughs> At the end of my first year, two years, I think it was, there I was, pulling at threads, having a fantastic time. <laughs> Nothing doing. So, anyhow, so we, we kept on well, trying to come up with different ideas and at about that time, uh, Hatton was uh, playing with some things and uh, Loretta Saruti, who was uh, the RA in the lab at the time, uh, had been doing some experiments for Hatton and what she had done was to take some uh, iodinated, so radio-labeled thrombin and incubated that with a cell extract from K562 cells, which were a leukemic cell line, and showed that when you incubate thrombin with this cell extract that you actually get a shift in complex. So there was something binding to the thrombin. And of course, um, this, this seemed like a reasonable thing to do. So Hatton, uh, being Hatton, said, why don't you just go and purify this, mate? won't take you long. <laughs> and that, that was when I came across the second thing about Hatton is his um, amazing uh, capacity for, uh, for underestimation of how, much, <laughs> how long it would take for things to be done. So, I mean, I, can't, I cannot tell you how many times in the lab there, uh, late in the afternoon, sitting down, talking through the, the experiments with Hatton, and he'd come up with all these ideas and he'd say, just do it, mate. It'll only take you 10 minutes. <laughs> three months later, still at, still at the bench, pushing away, trying to get these things. So, anyhow, so fair enough, this, was, this is what I set out to do. Um, and, of course, this was a little bit of a difficult task. Uh, and it was then um, that I discovered that uh, Professor Salem had an unusual approach to the laboratory equipment. <laughs> so this is the, uh, the kitchen blender, uh, and it's a very important piece of uh, equipment to be used in the laboratory. And I also discovered that Hatton had a particular um, passion and fetish uh, for placentas. And in fact, if you take uh, a large number of placentas and you put them into this, you end up with this. <laughs> which, look, <laughs> it, it looks for all the world like tomato soup, but uh, we, we mostly left the basil off. <laughs> You can see that this is a pretty rich soup of things to be playing with. Uh, and in fact, it had uh, grams and grams and grams of protein. And this was going to be a very difficult thing to do. Anyhow, I, like Chris, spent the next three years in the cold room, column after column after column, <laughs> purifying, purifying, purifying. After three years, I think I probably had about 10 or 15 micrograms of this stuff. Uh, and in fact, uh, that was enough for me to actually get some uh, amino acid sequence. And this proved to be. Um, an intracellular serpent, uh, which we at the time called placental thrombin inhibitor, uh, but which has subsequently been given the name of PI6, or proteinase inhibitor 6. Uh, there are, we actually went on and then started looking for others and found PI8 and PI9. And in fact, this was one of the early members uh, of a relatively uh, recently described uh, group of proteins, the intracellular serpents. And as it turned out, their role seemed to be that they were there to regulate uh, the intracellular proteolysis, so basically to protect cells uh, from their own proteases. And this was a thread which was really worth pulling, and in fact, I followed that lead over many years, uh, and, uh, and that has actually led me up to the present, uh, which is in a slightly different area. But I should just tell you a little bit about serpents, because serpents are things that um, I've spent a lot of time working on. They're, they're molecular mousetraps, so 
Basically what they do is they are uh, things which regulate proteases. Uh, so the uh, protease is the mouse in this particular uh, picture and what happens is that the protease comes up, it thinks that it's got something that it would like to bite and eat and as soon as it bites uh, the mouse trap is sprung and the mouse is killed. So what happens is that this, by, by cleaving a bait region here uh, the protease activates a massive conformational change uh, which then leads to the irreversible inhibition uh, of the target protease. Uh, and in fact, this is the sort of the molecular structure of these things. Uh, they have a, um, a bait region up here, which uh, is, looks like the substrate that the protease would like to bind onto and cleave. And then they have this rather complicated structure here, which is built around this, uh, this sheet here, this beta sheet here. And in fact, what happens... <coughs> ..is that the protease, uh, sorry, not the protease, um, this is actually heparin. Um, it binds on, causes a, a conformational change. The protease comes along, it bites the bait region, and that then leads to a big conformational change in the, in the protea, in the serpent rather, and the protease gets cleaved. Now, this is actually a representation of heparin cofactor 2, uh, and and its target thrombin. Um, and the thing about heparin cofactor 2 is that it has a tail, at this case, in this case it's actually the end terminus of the molecule, and what that does, it actually facilitates the binding of thrombin uh, to the serpent. And this is quite a feature of um, members of this family, that they often, as well as being recognised by their target protease, they often have something else which allows them to lasso or latch on to their target protease. Uh, and in the case of heparin cofactor 2, as I said, it's got a, a tail here. Um, heparin also functions this way, so heparin binds to part of the serpent molecule and also binds to thrombin and facilitates this, this interaction. So they're quite a, a snappy little molecule and there's a, a lot of evolution has gone into them. But my research has actually moved on since that time of the intracellular serpents uh, and more recently has headed down the direction of fibrinolysis. You, <clears throat> you've heard quite a lot about fibrinolysis today, <clears throat> so I won't actually go through the details of it, but it's clearly very important to remember that, that fibrinolysis, well, sorry, this is the, uh, the, the coagulation cascade which gets activated with tissue injury, but at the same time you get uh, the activation of the um, fibrinolytic pathway whereby tissue plasminogen activator is generated or released at points of injury, this leads to activation of plasminogen to plasmin. Plasmin can then cleave uh, fibrin and produce fibrin degradation products. And it's important to note that plasmin is directly regulated by alpha-2 antiplasmin, and this is one of the things that we've been particularly <coughs> interested in. Fibrinolysis is an important thing to be, be looking into. Uh, there are um, areas of need. You've heard earlier on today about different uh, plasminogen activators and things which can switch on the fibrinolytic pathway and this is clearly important in stroke, myocardial infarction and what we see a lot of which is deep vein thrombosis with post lipidic syndrome. So there are, there are certainly plenty of disease targets uh, where fibrinolysis uh, can be activated uh, and we can look for better outcomes. The drugs which we've already talked about today are things like recombinant TPA, retoplase, tenecteplase and the old fashioned drug, drug urokinase. And the things that you've already heard about today are that these are drugs which have generally have a very short half-life, um, they are associated with quite a significant risk of bleeding uh, and they need to be given intravenously, so um, not always easy to use. So there are many things that we could improve on. We felt that an area where we could actually make some contribution to this might be by looking at this interaction between plasmin and its natural regulator alpha-2 antiplasmin which is a member of the serpent family. So the sorts of things that we've been doing is looking at functional studies on the interaction between antiplasmin and plasmin and we've also been looking at plasminogen as an interesting molecule in itself. So I'll just summarise it by just pointing out to you how 
plasmon and antiplasmon interact. So what you have here, this is actually just a schematic, schematic representation of the alpha-2 antiplasmon uh, molecule, the serpent. And alpha-2 antiplasmon has, has stuck on at its C-terminus an extension. And that e extension is really important because what it does is it recognises the Kringle domains in plasmon and what happens then is that this C-terminal extension, having bound that part of plasmon, brings plasmon into apposition with the uh, bait region of the serpent and that then leads to the irreversible inhibition of plasmon. So uh, a, a useful interaction and we thought that this C-terminal area might be a useful target. Um, a lot of our work and this was published a couple of years ago, really looked at the important residues within this particular C-terminus which determine this, this interaction with the Kringle domains. And in fact, our idea was to see if we could manipulate this interaction by making antibodies which bind to this C-terminal domain of alpha-2 antiplasmin. And in fact, we made antipeptide antibodies, so they're relatively specific. Um, Antibody 3 binds further out at the C-terminus, antibody 2 closer in, and antibody 1 in this direction, right down near the body of the molecule. And in fact, when we tested these antibodies in a clot, a clot lysis model, what we found that was compared to control, antibodies 1, 2 and 3 caused progressive shortening of the clot lysis time. So that if you incubate, uh, if, you, if you produce a clot in a test tube, and include these antibodies, you can actually reduce the, the clot lysis time by about 50%. So that's a, a dramatic enhancement of the fibrinolytic potential. And what we basically have done since that time is to start working with um, Sean and Simone in the lab here and uh, use one of their uh, models of thrombosis, which I'm sure Sean will be, Sean will be talking about uh, in the near future, but basically it's a, a carotid um, clot um, thrombosis model and essentially what happens is that if you inject this antibody into mice uh, which have a carotid thrombosis and if you inject that after the injury has occurred, that you can in a substantial number of these mice you can actually open up this, um, this carotid occlusion. So we think that this approach of using antibodies to the C-terminus of antiplasmin uh, which stops it from inhibiting plasmin is a good way of switching on fibrinolysis. So what we hope is that antibodies like this, which in fact we would um, move on and, and use in a monoclonal antibody um, approach, would have a longer half-life, so monoclonal antibodies usually hang around for at least a week or two as a, as a profibrinolytic agent, and we think that they're likely to have less bleeding because certainly patients who are anti, uh, alpha-2 antiplasmin deficient have a relatively mild bleeding phenotype. So we hope that this will end up being a, a useful therapeutic at some stage in future. Our other work has also been to look at plasminogen. And in fact, plasminogen uh, was first described in the late 70s, early 80s. So it's actually a molecule which has been known about for a long time. It's the key clot dissolving enzyme. Uh, and um, it's quite a difficult molecule. It's a multi-domain um, molecule and it's quite conformationally labile and in fact one of the things that people have been trying to do for a long time is to understand how this molecule gets switched on, um, how its conformational ability subserves function uh, and how it does its job in general. And we, we have a, a general concept that plasminogen when it is circling, circulating is in a, in a locked conformation uh, which is inactive and then it's activated into an open conformation which becomes catalytically active and that happens in a number of different ways. The first thing is that the plasminogen can bind to fibrin and when it does so it changes its conformation and also uh, it can be cleaved by tissue plasminogen activator just next to its protease domain and also it can have its so-called pan-apple domain at the, uh, at the end terminus cleaved off and this also facilitates the activation of the molecule. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to see whether we could take a structural approach to that, which we did. And in fact, um, with work which is um, collaborative work with the uh, Monash Department of Biochemistry, and in particular with Ruby Law and James Wistock, um, basically 
uh, we were able to uh, get a crystal structure of plasminogen. And I think the key um, step in this process was to identify and to, and to realise that um, plasminogen has a number of glycoforms and that in, if in fact you purify one of those glycoforms that you can then get the molecule to, to, uh, to crystallise nicely. And so we've got quite a high resolution structure of plasminogen um, and what it shows is that this is the, um, the protease domain uh, and surrounding that protease domain is all these Kringle domains and they are all locked in place by this, by this so-called pan-apple domain. And in fact, the, the activation process of plasminogen is that TPA cleaves between the protease and the fifth Kringle, and then there's a feedback phenomenon whereby plasmin itself or other molecules of plasmin will cleave off the N-terminus and release this uh, pan-apple domain so that the Kringle domains can then unravel and allow the molecule to be functionally active. And I can show you that. I can't show you that, but I can actually just give you some, a better idea of the, of the shape of the molecule by letting it go round and round like that, which is very beautiful. So um, basically what this does is it allows us to ask a whole heap more questions about uh, how plasminogen works, how it gets activated, um, how it interacts with things like TPA and UPA uh, and also because plasminogen is important in so many other things so we know about what it does uh, in the brain with, with TPA and plasmin is also really important uh, in, tissue mot in cell motility within tissues and in fact most cells which are, move which are moving within tissue um, have at their, at their leading edge uh, UPA receptors which then allow um, plasminogen activation and a whole bunch of proteases to cause pro to proteins to move. So there's lots of different things that we can do. And in fact, uh, the thing which really strikes me is that our structure <laughs> is, is remarkably similar to, to this thing here. Uh, so I think that this will hopefully give us a whole heap more threads to pull and I think we'll be going with it for quite some time. So. That's all the data that I wanted to show you. I guess I just wanted to say a couple of things about Hatem because I've known Hatem for a long time. Uh, and there have been lots of really lovely things said about Hatem today, and I'm sure they're all absolutely true. Um, but I think I have a particular um, and unique insight into Hatem because one of the things that, that I've done that other people haven't done is I took over Hatem's um, private practice. And I should digress at this stage by saying that I remember that Chris Mitchell once said in the lab, that uh, using other people's HPLC columns was a little bit like wearing other people's underwear, <laughs> which I think, might, I think might be a Phil Majerus statement. But I can tell you now that taking over somebody else's private practice is like wearing their underwear, their shirt, their trousers, <laughs> using their toothbrush, everything. I've seen a lot. So, but what it does is it, it gave me an insight into Hatem. Um, we all know how hard he works, but I can tell you that um, from taking over his private practice, there was a huge amount of work to be done there. And, and the most important thing, I think, is that uh, without exception, all of his patients really uh, show him great respect and admiration and affection. And in fact, to this day, in fact, I saw patients this morning, they're all asking me, how's Professor Salem? What a wonderful man. <laughs> and the other thing that I should say about Adam, which is this, that this is a low resolution structure of Hatem. Um, <laughs> this is the man that we all know and see every day, uh, but in fact, uh, you don't actually have to scratch the surface very much to see this. <laughs> so just below the surface of, is, is Hatem the, the clown, and in fact, I think this is one of his finest features, uh, and one of the things that I've learned about him uh, that it doesn't matter how fantastic we all are, at the end of the day, don't take yourself too seriously. There's always a joke to be had. So I thank you all for listening and thank you, Adam, for the last 25 or more years.